So just give us, it's five o'clock and we're ready to get started. So today it's, we have a very special Let's Learn session and we are going to be talking about how to not kill your house plants with Trisha Bora, who's a plant keeper. She's a senior editor, she's a novelist, and she's a best-selling author. And what I like about her is she's like one of us, you know, so it is not like she was a gardener or this, that. So she has been taking her passion and her hobby, and she's really developed it. And she has more than 100 plants in her home in Mumbai. And we know the Mumbai homes are not very big. So I think she's probably utilizing all her space possible for these lovely, lovely plants. But if you're like me, you probably killed a lot of house plants, and you know I constantly do that. But a plant's death is a good starting point because it can help us answer the most important question: Why did it die? So if we have the right knowledge, you can make plants thrive for many, many years. And how not to kill your house plants in this? This is a new book by Trisha, which is the first ever comprehensive guide on how to take care of your house plants in the Indian context. Today, we are going to talk about how to choose the right plants for your space and your lifestyle, the right lighting requirements, when and how to water and fertile them, and what are the best potting mixes, and how to propagate plants. We will also have two show and tell. So we will be showing, Trisha will be showing us 10 plants which are excellent for the home and what is a good potting mixture. So first of all, Trisha, very warm welcome to Sipping Thoughts. We're excited to have you here. Thank you, Sukesi, for the warm welcome. It's lovely to be here chatting with all of you. So let's get started. You've coined this term, which I found very interesting. What is plant parenting? Plant parenting is um, a term which I haven't coined. I mean, it's been around for a while, especially on social media. And I think it takes a different view on uh, caring for our plants, right? So at like... I would say 10 years ago, we had plants at home, but we didn't give them that much focus, right? But house plants have become very popular uh, because of social media, number one. Social media has made it cool. And also it's changed the way we kind of look after our plants, right? So it's more uh, parenting rather than just gardening or like, you know, like, watering it once in a while and forgetting about it like people have started like looking after plants building plant collections and so plants have really come back like uh, coming to focus especially in the last five to six years internationally i would say and especially last year during the pandemic right when we were all stuck in our homes and we didn't have access to uh, parks and gardens so our house plants, our humble house plants, gave us that kind of feeling of being with nature, no matter how small they are. So, so now we talk about parenting plants rather than just, oh, like, you know, tilling the soil once in a while and then, okay, it's done. So, so tell I think shift of focus. So a lot of people, especially like you've said, in the COVID times have now really started to become and take up a lot of new hobbies. And of course, one of them is gardening. So, and I think a lot of it also stemmed from the fact, as you mentioned, that, you know, we didn't have a lot of green areas to go to, but because also we've been told now that we want to also bring more purification, more better vibes also into the house. What is your thought on that? So I do believe that plants are one of the best remedies, you know, to bring in obviously a slice of nature, like I said, because, you know, when you look at a plant, its forms are not uh, uh, concrete or, or like um, uh, solid, like inanimate objects. Like when you look at a desk or a painting, right, it's a very solid object, but um, plants have more natural fluid forms. So they immediately make us feel better, right? It's like, um, I would compare it to watching fish. So they say that when you watch fish in an aquarium, it calm, even if it's in an aquarium, right? It kind of calms you down. In fact, people um, who have a hypertension or even heart disease, they are recommended, they are advised to kind of watch fish. And you'll find that even in places like, like when you go to monasteries, especially Buddhist monasteries and things uh, and places like that, they will always have koi ponds because water and fish 
kind of make you feel at ease they make you feel uh, calm down like less stressed out and i feel plants have that same effect so i do believe that plants help reduce stress uh, i mean we can feel it immediately right like how many of us we 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 go for a walk uh even if it's like a short walk just down the road if there are avenue trees there are birds we feel so much more refreshed when we come back and plants do that have that same effect when it comes to air purification i have a slightly different take on this i mean if you go to any nursery right now you will find plants being sold as air purifiers right but just think about it logically i mean how can one plant a small plant or two plants or even 10 plants be able to purify let's say a 1000 square feet house now this idea has come from it actually originated when um in in the in the late 1990s when nasa nasa was creating uh, um was basically testing if plants could purify air and they uh, they conducted this experiment and they found that plants yes they can purify the air but you need a whole bunch of plants and this experiment was done in a sealed room right so there's no exchange of outside air there's no exchange of other like you know uh, gases coming in it was in this like clinically sealed room and filled with plants now the thing is our houses are not sealed right uh, we are windows and things like that they're not absolutely sealed uh we leave our windows open doors open so it's i mean like uh lodge i mean very seriously if you think about it you 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 will need to fill your house with plants to get that kind of air purification benefit now now the thing is why it works is because people um i mean any nursery man or online plant seller it really works for them when they pitch plants as air purification because people want those benefits but sadly it is a myth i mean you will not have walking space for the number of plants you will need right you will have to remove all your tables chairs everything to be able to get that benefit and it's not um it's not ideal and it's not a solution unfortunately it's a marketing tactic so tell us a little bit more trisha about your journey how did you get into and how did this kind of become a hobby a passion of yours yeah because you're an editor you're a novelist i mean you have a lot of other careers also that you have yeah, lots of other hobbies so the thing is now so you see i grew up in assam and my parents worked in the tea gardens right so i was always surrounded by a lot of i was surrounded by nature my mother was a uh, my mother is a brilliant gardener but back then in these tea garden bungalows you had a lot of space to like have beautiful gardens and things like that so my mom has a green thumb definitely okay but and back then as a kid i didn't it's not like i sat and learned from her or anything you know as kids you just reap the benefits of what your parents do like she had a beautiful garden and we played in it right so it's not like i was taking notes or learning from her or anything but um so i grew up there and then i moved uh, to delhi for to study um uh, Uh, for under graduation and even then i wasn't really into plants or anything like that but when i finished college and i got a flat of my own uh, i wanted to decorate it and plants are very easy right uh, you get a few plants in your house immediately looks better so i bought all these plants and i killed each and every one of them in a couple of months because i didn't know the i i didn't i barely knew the names of these plants i didn't know how to look look after them i thought i just had to water them a few days and they'll be fine but then later i moved to bangalore and um, that's when i thought bangalore has great climate great weather and it has beautiful nurseries and so once again i brought home lots of plants and this time i started paying more attention like i used to ask the nursery man what is the what is this plant called what is the care required so i started observing noticing and things like that and i realized the more attention i gave these plants the more i noticed and actually sat down and you know like uh, fast over them the better they did and then we i was in bangalore with my husband for uh, three three and a half years and then i moved to bombay 
and our flat has a view a very small but beautiful south west facing balcony which is like the perfect light for indoor plants uh, and so i got more plants and i really like got into gardening and caring for plants once i moved here now you brought up a good question what's the difference between indoor plants and outdoor plants is there a big difference between that there is so the thing is uh, indoor plants don't require direct sunlight right but outdoor plants like your fruiting plants or flowering plants they must have at least a minimum of 6 hours of direct light that is sun that is falling on them right but inside you can still have plants like you know kept somewhere further inside further into your home so they will still live but uh, for example a rose plant or a pear tree or or any like vegetables like let's say peas or potatoes and things like that they will require much more sunlight so there is a difference So now let's come back to this thing that you brought up that when you started to take care of your plants and we hear the term plant parenting. So is it like a lot of work because you know that's kind of then becomes very scary of saying it you you know it is going to be too much to handle. So I feel that it's you know it is gardening is a bit of work right there is you have to change the soil you have to water you have to feed your plants you have to prune you have to dust you have to clean your space up the mess you make once you like pot repot your plants <clears throat> that is the basic work that you have to do but i feel that once you understand what your plants require right in a broad holistic way like the fundamentals of plant care then your job becomes really easy uh what i mean is that once you know what just say this plant right which is a ficus if i know what this plant needs and i give the plant those conditions then it will try and my job gets cut down by half right so then i'm not like troubleshooting oh why are the leaves falling off or oh, why is it suddenly turn brown and diseased because i know because i'm already giving it uh, the right cultural and environmental conditions that this plant requires right so what are those conditions those uh, what are those factors there are i would say broadly to get plant parenting or plant keeping right you need to look at four things which is light soil watering and environmental conditions but i'll get back to that later okay. so the right light is fundamental you try talk more about light yeah yes please do because i think this is one of the most confusing because you know when we put our plants on the balcony and weather changes right so you are you don't know what is that right light that the plants need and is it different for different plants and so you end up and where do you get this information or do you need to kind of do it per plant yeah so see as a rule of thumb when we are talking about indoor plants right we just need to understand it one thing is that 90% of the plants that we keep indoors like ornamental the ones that we keep on our balconies maximum on our balconies but the ones that stay inside uh 90% of them come from tropical parts of the world all right and where do these plants grow these plants either grow in the understory of forest so you have the huge forest cover and they'll grow in the dappled shade right so it's not like the trees where they need that direct light and um, if they're not growing in the understory they they're growing as epiphytes which means that these are plants that grow upon trees okay so once we know that we know the kind of light these plants require and this is 90% of all house plants so um house plants don't require that bright direct sunlight that falls in the afternoon that is the worst thing we can do for them because if we put like philodendrons and monsteras out in that harsh afternoon light these plants the leaves will start burning because they can't handle that kind of intense light what these plants require is something called like you will find this everywhere this term bright indirect light okay but what is bright indirect light 
is actually very simple. So this this uh, lights uh, setting, you can call it a setting, is for almost all your house plants except for cacti. We all know that cacti need they come from a hot place, so they need direct sunlight, most of them. But this bright indirect light is basically early morning light, which falls the soft morning light that falls on our plants. And after that, your plant should be able, you basically you need to go down to your plant's level, right? So if your plant is on the ground, you go down and look at look out of the balcony or window, or wherever it is. And see, if your plants can see some sky, right, or some sun, that is the light they need. So you cannot keep your plants in a corner where there's no, where they have no direct line of vision to the sky. So if the best places to keep your plants is by your windows and doors, not, not where the sun is hitting them in full force, but where they're getting the early morning light and after that, it's that they can see the sky, but no direct sun. That is the perfect light for these plants because these are green leafy plants. They don't need that kind of intense light that flowers need or fruits need, right? Because they don't need to photosynthesize that much. So light is crucial, right? Without light, we know that without light, plants, um, plants use light uh, converted into sugars and chemicals in the process called photosynthesis. So without light, they can't do that. And if you keep them in a very dark area, they'll grow. They'll grow. Some plants will live, but they'll probably won't grow as fast. They'll probably become sickly in some time. They'll get pests and things like that. And they'll also uh, some some will just wither and die. Right. So light is essential. So what about these new concept of low light plants and all of this? What about those? Yeah. So again, I would say a lot of it is, you know, when I see plants being sold as no light plants, like this plant can live with no light, you just have to know that it is a gimmick, right? Because it's like saying that here's a human being that requires no water. He can live anywhere, right? But you know that that's, just impossible. So all plants need light, right? There are some varieties that are more versatile. Okay, so they can, they're more adaptable and they can tolerate low light areas for a longer time. But it's not like they, they can live in that dark spot forever. So keep them there for like six months and you will see either no growth or death. But Low light is something where, you know, only very few varieties can withstand it for, I would say, max one month. But you shouldn't even push it to one month. The best way to do it is to say you want, um, there's an area of your home that you want to keep a plant, right? You want to decorate that spot with a plant. What do you do? It has no light. It's like a dark area. So the best way to do, to decorate that spot is to get two of the same variety of the same plant, right? Two, like two twins. So you keep one in a bright area for two weeks and you keep the other guy in a dark area in the place you want to decorate. And after two weeks, you get the other guy and you put him in that dark spot and you send the other guy to go make some food. Okay, so, but essentially you cannot keep plants in absolutely dark spots or very low light. You can, however, I mean, in India, you don't have this in the market commercially yet, which is grow lights, right? Internationally, you find grow lights, so you can just plug it on. I think you get them in Ikea. It's not here in India as of yet, but you, it's like a normal bulb. It's a full LED, uh, full spectrum LED bulb, which you uh, plug into your normal lampshades and things like that. So if you have a plant here, let's say, you place your lampshade somewhere over it, right? Your uh, grow light over it. And that light is sufficient. Now you can use uh, full spectrum LED lights. You can give it a try, but you will have to kind of watch the plant, observe and see how it's doing. Is it like, if, it, if you see the leaves are, like this is any regular white bulb, right? An LED white bulb. Now, if you see that the uh, leaves are turning yellow, it is the light is probably too close to it. So you, it's burning the leaves. 
So you adjust the height, right? You adjust the distance. And it's something you will have to uh, figure out for yourself. Like you just watch, take notes and adjust as you go along. So the first is, of course, the light. The second you said was the soil. Soil. But I think we'll get to soil when we talk about the potting mixes. Okay. Um, let's talk about watering. Watering, now, yes. Watering. There's also a question that's come, like the watering schedule and what is the right time from Annie? <laughs> Hi, Annie. So watering is everybody's like problem, right? I overwater my plants, I kill my plants. Now they say that, um, you know, like 90% of the people kill their plants because of overwatering, right? But the thing with watering is it's, it's not just, you know, it's a symptom. It's not the real problem. The real problem is actually, it's a combination of light, soil and water, right? So think of it like this. Forget about what you've learned, what you know about watering. But think of it like this. If your soil medium is very dense, right? Whatever soil is in your pots, if it is very dense and you keep pouring water into it, then that soil will always rem remain very compact, right? It'll be very heavy. So, but, it, but if you have a porous soil, which is loose and um, which dries up quickly, so no matter how much you pour into it, that soil will keep drying out much faster, right? And, and the thing is that we need a porous soil. For indoor plants, the soil requirement is very different, right? And it affects our watering. Now, the thing is, always water, never water on a schedule. This is what I tell everyone. Don't be like Sunday is when I water my plants. And that's it. All right. Always check your soil. So the way to do it is uh, the best way to see if your plants need any water is do their leaves droop a bit, right? Not completely that the plant just collapsed and died and then you're asking this question like should we water it now? But you, you, you know your plant, right? A plant's leaves will usually be up but droop slightly. That means they're thirsty. The leaf is losing. It doesn't have water, right? So it's kind of falling. That is the number one sign that your plants require water. Number two is if you want to be 100% certain, take a chopstick mm. or a stick. Uh, most mm. people use the finger test method, but I don't like that because, you know, the finger test method is where you stick a finger into the soil, like two inches into the soil. And if it's wet, then the soil is still wet. And so you don't have to water it, right? But I prefer using a chopstick because the chops you can you can really poke it right into the soil, in the side of your pot. And when you pull it out, if the chopstick is still wet and has mud on it, that means the soil is wet and you don't need to water. But if it comes out dry, that means you it you can water. Always water in the mornings. Early mornings is the best time to water because it gives your plant and the soil enough time to dry before the evening sets in. If you water in the evenings, uh, this is for indoor plants. Outdoor plants is a totally different game. For indoor plants, if you water in the evening, the soil remains wet for a much longer period of time, right? Because it's cooler in the evening. This is like a great breeding ground for pests, for mold and fungus and things like that, right? So always water in the morning, water into the pot, never onto the leaves and things like that, because that creates again fungus, it creates leaf burn. Because think of the leaf, if the leaf is, has water on it and the sun is beating down on it, it will burn, right? So always water into the soil, never splash it onto your leaves, water in the morning and always check the soil before you water. Like actually check the soil. That if you are confused, See, if my soil, if it's the, if the soil is dry, only then water. The only case where I would say don't let your plant dry out too much, too much is for ferns, because ferns require a kind of moist, uh, kind of wet soil. They thrive in those kind of soil. That's the only exception. And the third thing you said after the watering is, uh... is environmental condition, yes. right? So now that is something that is, it's a very personalized view of gardening. Now the thing is, 
it's easy to give advice, right? Like west facing balcony, do this, do that, do this. If your house is east facing, have these plants, do not have these plants. That is a very general thing. But it doesn't work completely because your west facing balcony may have another huge building blocking the light, right? And mine may have nothing but sky. So the conditions will change, right? Also, you live in Delhi, I live in Bombay. Your air is very different, right? Your weather system is very different. Delhi has hot, dry air, whereas Bombay, Kerala, and like the southern areas have hot, humid air. That changes how we parent our plants, right? So if you live in Delhi, you will probably need to water your plants that is in the hot summer twice a day, especially in peak summer, let's say May, June, because you'll find that the soils are drying out much faster. But in, in Bombay, in the monsoon, I will not water my plants. I'll probably water my plants once a week or twice a week because it's so humid that there's a lot of moisture in the air and my soils are not drying out. And I don't want to keep watering it to, into it because that's what causes root rot, right? So it's not overwatering that kills plants. It's actually root rot. What is root rot? Root rot is when your soil is so wet that your the roots become mushy. Because think of it like as putting, leaving a piece of paper in water. What happens after a while? It just disintegrates, right? So it needs to have, roots need to have air. It can't be a cloggy, wet soil. They hate it. That is like drowning, right? Drowning for plants. So environmental conditions is to be aware of where you live, what weather systems you have, uh, the kind of light your home receives and tweak your gardening care accordingly. Another very like uh, big example is if you live in a hill station, you will uh, in North India, you will have two very clear seasons, right? You will have growing season, you will have rest season. In the rest season, you don't um, you don't fertilize your plants certain plants and you do not water your plants that much because your plants are resting. Whereas in southern India or western India or in coastal areas where you don't have that clear distinction, right, between winter, summer, fall and things like that, you don't have these seasons. So you keep fertilizing your plants always. Like there's, there's no, we don't stop not fertilizing. So these are the so you said a very interesting thing that why do plants die and we kill our plants because we kill the root rot. So can you yeah. go a little bit deeper into that? Because so that we understand that why do actually our plants die? And we will come back, I know, for the potting mixture because he's actually going to show yeah. it to us. It's all linked to the kind of soil you use. Yeah. So, so root rot fundamentally is the root. So we have to understand that the roots are the main system of your plants okay you need a healthy root system for uh to have if the roots disintegrate you will not have a good plant no matter how much you fertilize it no matter what kind of light you give it now root rot happens when the soil is always wet it's not because of fungus and things like that it's more because the roots are drowning they don't have air to breathe and roots need air to breathe we don't uh, think of it like that because, you know, they're buried in soil. We don't think about, we forget about the uh, roots and its health. But your plant should always have a healthy root system. And a healthy root system is when your plant's roots can breathe in a very porous soil. Okay. Now, healthy roots, what are healthy roots? If you pull up a plant, you will see that the roots are white. Uh, healthy roots should be white firm and fleshy, okay? So when you press it, it should have light. And if you if you see a pl any plant in your house that is dying, what you should do is you should pull it out of its pot and examine the roots. You will notice 100% that the roots, if you touch them, they kind of fall off. And they're like gray or dark colored. And they have a, a bit of a foul smell because they're decomposing. So that essentially is root rot. How do you prevent it? 
by giving it the right light, by watering it very carefully, and by having a soil mixture, a potting mixture that is very light, fluffy, and most importantly, quickly draining, right? So if you pour water into it, after an hour, when you come back, the soil should not be, you know, like when you take, if you take a, a handful of the soil out and press it, it should not be dripping. It should be almost like the water has completely run up through it and it's like crumbling in your hand. This is like an hour later. So, so yeah, so it is, it's like a holy trinity of light, soil and water. All these things have to be in balance, right? But once we understand this, right, then we can have plants anywhere and we can take care of like just about any variety. So now I think we're getting to that part where everybody is dying to see what is the soil mixture and what are the plants that you recommend that are best for homes? Okay, so let me do the plants first. Yeah? Perfect. Okay, so what I've got with me, I've got 10 plants that are great for homes, right? And that are hardier, will give you less trouble and are also perfect for beginners. Just give me a second. Yeah, so these are plants that I would say, you know, it's always tempting to go into a nursery and pick out the most beautiful plant, get it home. And then you realize, oh my God, I don't know what to do with this plant. It's very complicated. It's very high maintenance. So, and then maybe that plant dies and you get discouraged and you don't want to, you know, like it kind of deters you from buying more plants or maybe you've spent a lot of money on it and you're disappointed. So I would say it's always good to start off with plants that species and varieties that are kind of tough, right? So even if it takes a bit of battering, it bounces back with a little bit of care. So what are these varieties? So number one is the, it's called the snake plant. Is it clear? Yeah. So this is the Sansevieria and it's the number one plant for houses. This is something I would recommend to everybody. It's called the mother-in-law's tongue. Why? Because the one saying goes that like the mother-in-law, once it gets going, it never stops. So this, is, so this is like the number one house plant. It's very hardy. Uh, it can thrive in both low light and um, uh, very strong light. You, you can absolutely forget about watering this plant. You water it maybe once in 10 days and it will be happy. You can, you know, I've even not watered this for a month and it will not die. So this is the plant you give people, who, your friends or family who kill their plants. This is the plant um, you give um, as gifts. It makes a great gift because, you know, it won't wither and die away. And um, I also have more details about all these plants in my book, right? So I'm sorry, I can't turn to that page, right? I'm sorry, Sukhiti, I'm just finding the no right. No worries, no worries. Okay, I can't find the right page, but I'm saying that in my book, we have these descriptions. Is that clear? So we have the plant and we have this specific care guide here. So it makes it very simple. I'll find the right plant for the, the right pages for the other plants. So that's plant number one. Plant number two is very interesting because if you look at it, you will think this is the money plant. But can you see the leaf? It's very pretty. I think they're a little dusty. But so this is the skin dapsid, right? It looks uh, quite similar to the money plant, but it is not the money plant. So this uh, variety was not available available in India for the longest time. But now it's become very common. 
I like this plant because one, it's very cheap. You find it in nurseries everywhere. And uh, it is super easy to take care of it. You can put it in a hanging basket. You can put it in water, you know, a few stalks in water and keep it anywhere. It does well in lower light conditions, but obviously not no light, but it can thrive in lower light, but and also me, a bright indirect light. And you can just forget about this plant because you water it once a week, twice a week, and it will still live. And still it's quite, a, it has a tough constitution. So that is the Skindaxis. Plant number three is the Aurelia. Now this is a plant, it's a very pretty plant. It has these beautiful curly leaves and these wiry stems. Right? So this is a plant that used to be very fashionable, like in the 1980s, uh, 90s. Like you would see, all our parents on, on my mother used to have tons of these plants. But now it's kind of fallen out of fashion because you, you know, all these monsteras and philodendrons have taken over. But it's actually a very hardy plant because, again, you can grow it in just about any soil. You can keep it in low light. You can keep it in no, uh, I mean, uh, in bright light. And the best part is that it is quite pest resistant. I've had this plant for over five years and I have zero pests, like no mealybugs, no, uh, you know, like fungus or things like that. Now, so the Aralia, there are many varieties of it. This is just one, but it's a great beginner plant. And I can't find the page for this. I'm so sorry. Uh, let's find it. Yeah, this, found it. So this is the Aralia in the book. This is a different variety. And this is the care guide. So if you get this book, you'll have like specific instructions for your various varieties. So that's plant number two. Oh, Elise, I'm going to show the Aurelia again. Can you show your yeah. plant again? It's got these wiry stems, right? That look quite cute. Yeah? Perfect. Now, plant number four, just give me a second. This is a huge plant. This is plant number four, which is Dracaena. Can you see it? I mean, if I go back a little. Yes. Now, Dracaena is a wonderful plant. This is just one variety. If you go to the nursery, you'll find tons and tons of varieties. Dracaenas require very little care and they're pest resistant. So you will find pests on all your plants, but your Dracaenas, you will never find any pests. They thrive in low light. In fact, when you go to offices, you'll the plants that you will notice are uh, the ones you know, you find these big trees and offices and things like that. Most of, most of the times, it's a Dracaena because they even do well with normal fluorescent light, right? So if you have low light or something and you want like a statement plant, this is the plant because it, the ma maintenance is very low. It is a very cheerful plant. It has a, you know, like a pleasing personality, not a diva, will not throw a, a, like a fuss. It, it won't throw a fit if you don't water it uh, on time or if you don't feed it on time. So this is one of my favorite varieties because it is so easy to care for. And that is the Dracaena. Um, now the next one is, it's here. It's the Monstera Peru. It's not the Monstera with the, you know, the classic fenestration. This is a, a very different kind of Monstera. Can you see the leaves look a bit like 
the leaves are tougher, right? They're more, they're thick. This is a small specimen. I have a larger plant. So the Monstera Peru is, again, very easy to take care of. You know, there's one trick to figuring out which plants will be easy to take care of, right? And that is if the leaves are very thick, the foliage is dark, uh, dark green, and the leaves are very thick, you know that it's a good indication that the plant can hold on to water better. So plants that have thinner leaves, uh, more, you know, kind of papery, those will be tougher to take care of. But these ones with their kind of thick, almost dragon, uh, dragon skin like leaves, these are much easier. So this you can grow in a hanging basket. You can grow like this in a small pot. You can even put a few cuttings in water. It will just thrive. It will give you no problems and keep growing. You can also grow it in a moss pole because it's a vine. So you put a little stick or a moss pole and it will start climbing upwards, right? So this is the Monstera Peru. The next plant is another variety. Uh, or Actually, it's not a Monstera, but it's called a mini Monstera. Now, everyone loves the Monstera, right? It's one of the most, it's the trendiest plant. I mean, it's been the trendiest plant for a few years now. This is the Monstera. I don't know if you can see it. But this is called the mini Monstera because its leaves look like the Monstera. But it's not. It's actually uh, called Raphidophora tetrasperma. Bit of a mouthful, the name. But why I recommend this plant is that a lot of people get the big Monstera and find that it is quite a fussy plant. Like it needs a certain kind of soil. It needs a certain kind of light. And it is a slow growing plant. Now everybody gets a small specimen because the big specimens are really expensive. So you get a small specimen and then you keep waiting and waiting for it to you know, become bigger and bigger. But this is amazing because it looks like the Monstera, but it's less fussy and it grows really quickly. Now I've taken cuttings from a bigger plant and I put it in soil. And this is, this is the growth after just two months. So it's a great one to have if you're impatient and if you like to see results quickly. After that is, um, is cacti, right? So I'm not picking one particular kind of cacti. This is just a normal cacti, a cactus. Now, why are cactus great? Because if you are forgetful or if you forget to water your plants, if you don't have that much time, you're very busy, you have a like you know a, a hectic schedule and life and life these guys don't require your attention so it's better to not give them any any attention rather than you know like fussing over them they don't want to be fussed over so they um it's uh, they need a lot of light for sure and they need a very different kind of potting mix which is more porous where water runs through more quickly but otherwise like you can just put one in the soil and totally forget about them. Uh, in my book, I have a huge section on cactus. For example, there's the cactus, which is the desert cactus, like the one I showed you. These are more, these have spines. They are more prickly. They require very dry soil. And then you have the forest cactus, right? which is like the Brahma Kamal and things like that. These require a little less harsh light and more watering, but essentially they are from the same family. Then we have, again, one of my favorite plants. I'm sorry, it's a bit dusty because it's been out on the balcony. It's called the ZZ plant or the ZZ plant. I mean, it's a very cool plant. It is another one which can grow in very low light conditions. Like if you have this, you can just take one little clip of this plant, put it back in the soil and it will grow. You can take one leaf and put it in the soil and it will grow into this entire bush of a plant. 
Now, the great thing about this plant is if you keep it in um, a low light setting, just stop watering it, right? So if it's in a dark setting, just stop watering it and it'll do well. Now, if you're putting it out on the balcony or somewhere with more light, you need to water it more. But it is a great plant to give people, again, who kill their plants or to people, you know, who maybe are complete beginners to plant parenting. So those are your 10 plants. I hope some of you go out and get one of these varieties. You will not be, oh, I, there are two more, sorry. Two more, yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So then is the, now this is a very common plant, right? A, this is called the heart leaf philodendron because the leaves look like heart. Again, this is not the money plant. This is a philodendron variety. Now you brought up the money plant and a lot of people are asking, what about the money plant? <laughs> Yeah, the money plant is great. See, so the money plant is called pothos. Okay, the botanical name. And the pothos is also a wonderful plant. I mean, I have at least two baskets full of them because you don't need to, um, because you know, the, everybody who's had a money plant knows how easy it is. You can just put stalks like this. This looks like a money plant, but you can just take a cutting from here. These are the nodes, right? So you cut from here and you put this in water or in soil and it'll grow. And you, you don't have to worry too much about these plants, but yes, they do get um, some pests, right? So if the soil is wet for too long, you will notice some scale. You may notice mealybugs. Mealybugs are these white critters that come and suck the sap of your plants, but they are super easy. Now this entire basket that I have, I took a few cuttings from a friend and just planted it, right? And it's become this big basket. So this is a, a very easy plant and it looks quite pretty once the bush is, you know, once, once it becomes bushy, once the basket is full and like flowing, it looks quite pretty. You can also grow it as a, uh, these are all creeping, binding plants. So if you put a stick, a moss stick, it'll grow up like that. Right? And the leaves will get bigger then. So this is number nine. And what is our last plant? It is peperonia. Peperonia. So this is the peperonia. And I, I always recommend this plant to people who say, I don't have the place or the space to keep plants. Because these plants don't grow very large, right? They will remain. Th this plant I've had for three years and it it's the size has remained this, right? So the thing is, there's a huge variety of peperomias. All my plants are very dusty. I'm really sorry about that. There's a huge variety of peperomias, but, and they're very easy to care for. But I would say that if you're looking for peperomia, always check the ones, like check if the leaf is tough. If the leaf is like fleshy, you know that that will do better. Okay, so peperomias are really easy. You can, uh, all mine grows in an east facing balcony. So it receives early morning light and it doesn't receive like direct light or anything after that. It, uh, you don't need to fertilize it that often. I would say once a month and uh, yeah, only water it when the soil is dry. That's my rule for all plants, except ferns. Water it when the soil is dry. Okay. So, now, question has come up because of, yes. I mean, people are also asking, you're also saying your plants are dusty. So yeah. what is the right way, can you, I mean, to clean your plants? To clean, yeah. So the best, how I clean, see right now, I, uh, my, our entire building is, um, there's some construction going on. So there's perpetual dust. So even if uh, we clean it in the morning, by evening, it, they all become dusty. But what I do is when, uh, when the situation is back to normal and you'll find that every 10 days, it's good to clean your plants because there'll be a layer of dust. We live in India. We can't help it. it. It is one of the things we need to do. So what I do is I take the sponge. I take a sponge. You know, the sponges that we use for um, uh, in our kitchen or the microfiber cloths that we use in our kitchen, right, to clean. So I keep one for my plants. And what I do is I take the leaf 
I uh, dampen the sponge and I just run the sponge over it, back and front, because even the back, you know, the spores are there in the back, in the underside of the leaves too. So you should do this, like not dripping wet, but it should be damp enough to catch all the dust and kind of um, clean it up. So that is one way. The other, uh, other thing that I do when I have the time is I take all of my really big plants, like the spikers, the monstera, I take them in the shower and I just leave the shower on for a bit, right? So that way, that stream of water will also kind of wash away any, if there are any pests, if there are, if, if there's anything like un, unwanted in the like stems and things like that, I'll wash it away with that pot. So those are the two ways to clean plants. Now, a couple of questions on other plants, the spider plant and the archaea palm. Yeah. What do you want to know about them exactly? Are they good for house plants? They're brilliant. The areca palm uh, is a bit trickier because a lot of the uh, nursery sellers will say it's a great indoor plant, but actually it requires more light than uh, most of our houses have. So they grow very well on balconies uh, that are west facing. And if you keep it like anywhere less than a west or a south facing balcony, it is bound to get pests. And you will notice it very quickly. You will find scale, which is like these black dots on the plant. On the leaves, you'll find scale, you'll find mealybugs, you'll find a host of other things. So the areca palm, I would say, is better for balconies. And But the spider plant is a great plant to grow. Uh, it just looks beautiful once it starts having those little plantlets. Like if, they, if you leave it on the plant, it looks like this beautiful cascading curtain of, you know, like more plants and um, because those little plantlets, you can actually chop up and put in smaller pots. So yeah, the, that is a great plant to grow. Uh, it has a very thick root system. So you need to be very careful when watering it. Just water it when the soil is completely dry. Awesome. So some uh, another question before we go on to the potting mis uh, mixture. Nirmala is asking, she's got the archaea palm, but it's not growing. Some in the shade and drooping in dark leaves. It's in the shade? Some in the shade, yes, are drooping and dark leaves. Okay. So that, that it's a complicated plant. It's not a very easy plant, although you see it so often. I would say give it more sun. Put it in a brighter spot. Uh, water it only when the soil is 100% dry, right? So use the chopstick method. Check if the soil is actually dry and uh, give it some fertilizer. Once you do all of these things, it is bound to improve. All right, now we're dying to see the potting mixture and I know we are also running out of time, but thank you for showing us all those plants. I posted it again. These are yeah. the 10 that have been recommended by Trisha as being the easiest ones, especially for house plants. Okay, great. So uh, before I show you the mixture, I just want to tell you, so we had that entire talk about soil, right? Why is in indoor plants, why do we need a different kind of soil? Now, Think about, about it like this. When you grow plants outdoors in the garden, right? If you keep watering it, nothing will happen because the water will run through the soil, right? But indoors, your plants are in pots. It does not have any place to run through. So it should be able to evaporate quickly. Like we have talked about root rot and things like that. Your soil should be able to dry out very quickly because you have less light at home. Uh, which means that evaporation will be slower, right? Now, what happens is when we go to the nursery, we buy the few plants and we get them home and they don't do well, right? This is what happens to most people. We go, go out to the nursery, we go get these beautiful plants and then they die in a few months or whatever, in a year's time. Because the nursery soil is very different. It's dense. If you look at your plants that you recently bought from a nursery, you'll notice that the soil is either red that red color soil, that mitti that we get, the garden mitti, mixed with a bit of manure and that's it, right? Now do that water test that I told you, like put that, put water in the soil, come back an hour later, you'll find that it's still very like uh, hard, very claggy. Now what's happening, you'll have root rot. So what I do is I use a very porous potting mix. 
right which is which has got a few elements that help in not only re retaining water but also giving it some air right so let me just show you the elements is it visible yes it is so i use this thing called pumice i don't know if you can see it can you see it yes we can so this is a very porous material right it's it's made out of volcanic rocks yeah can you see it yeah yeah so this helps in aerating the soil right when i mix this in then there's this there's this is cocoa chips now cocoa chips is a by product of coconuts and it is excellent at holding on to water right and this is cocoa peat cocoa is peat is also cocoa cocoa peat okay. p e a t so this okay. is also a by product of coconuts and it is uh, it creates a very fluffy texture to your mix and it also um holds on to water right so what i do is so this is um sorry can you see this mm -hmm. so this is a mixture that i've made it's called the jungle mix right so i've been using this for many many years and i've recently just uh packaged it so i'll show you the texture give me one minute mm. Oh, I don't think you it's, add you know. these three things to the soil. Is that what you do? Yeah. Can you? I just want to get the camera right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So if you can, if you notice, it's a very light soil. Right. It is not heavy at all, and the water will just run through this. So what I've done is, in this soil, I've mixed cocoa peat, which is good at retaining water. i've mixed pumice these white things which is pumice stone right so i mix a bit of pumice stone into it and then i've added uh tree bark which is uh, like the bark you get from trees and um some charcoal and a bit of compost right for nutrients and then you have this really fluffy mix this is what i use for all my indoor plants because if i water this and i come back in an hour this soil will be damp it will be moist but it will not be dripping with water and that's exactly the kind of uh, mix or the soil mix your plants require right so what i do is you can actually take half half garden soil which is your red or black soil that you get from the nurseries and mix this into that right so then you have this you create porosity you create that air circulation you create good drainage and that is actually the secret to getting your soil right one more question any preference on pots that we should use to grow our indoor plants are there some pots that are better i know i saw that question came up a little bit before yeah there are actually so <laughs> sorry so the thing is like when i talked about environmental conditions right so um if you live in my, my let's go back to that yeah so if you live in say a humid place you need pots that do not hold water right because there's so much moisture in the air your uh, your soil will not dry out faster so terracotta pots or regular clay pots are much better than because clay is a porous material right so it allows water to escape it allows excess water to escape it if you have it in a plastic pot it will keep holding on to water 
but let's say if you live in jaipur or delhi where it is so hot you don't want to keep watering your plants right so then plastic pots are better because plastic holds on to water so it's not that one is better than the other you have to think of where you are and your lifestyle now even in jaipur and delhi and rajasthan and these places you can use clay pots but you just are you okay watering twice a day if you are okay watering twice a day then go for it so it's not like one is worse than the other or one is you know like um, uh, uh, one is better it's just about your lifestyle and where you live now for most of my indoor plants i prefer terracotta pots because you know it allows the water to escape but for ferns for plants that like to be a little uh, moisture bound i would like to have more moisture in the soil like ferns i use plastic pots now question that has come up from seema that do you also add fertilizer to your soil mix yes uh, so i use compost compost is a great fertilizer right what is compost it is basically when uh, all our fruits vegetables those peels and things like that which decompose and they make this beautiful nutrient rich um fertilizer it is that it's full of um good bacteria it's full of npk which is nitrogen phosphorus and potassium these are the things that our plants require right so compost i use compost but there are different kinds of fertilizers you can get any but just find one that's suitable for indoor plants for example fruiting and flowering plants will require totally different fertilizers right so you can find a lot of this information in my book i have a whole section on seeding which uh, which can be very useful for people who don't who are new to plants how to feed when to feed right so there's, there's a lot of information in there synthetic fertilizers over organic fertilizers so But, two more questions we will take one is preetas she has a cherry tomato plant that was growing well but started having some wormy white lines on the leaves what can she do that those white lines i think it's it's by this it's an insect called the leaf miner if i'm not mistaken i they make these intricate patterns on the leaves right now leaf miners uh, miner as an m i n e r they come and mine the leaf and they dig up all these like they uh, eat up all the nutrients what you can you need to use a systemic fungicide right just look up systemic fungicides for tomatoes and use them but i would only resort to that as a last you know as a last resort what i would do is i would just i'll i will pick those leaves off and throw them that's the best way because the leaf miner is not living on your plant it's coming to your plant eating it and leaving right so a systemic fungicide is the last resort for the time being just pick out those leaves because those leaves are actually not diseased it's just what is been left behind by this the leaf miners work of art let's say so himangini is asking she's lost a lot of plants to aphids roses crotons crotons hibiscuses she doesn't want to use pesticide is there a non chemical option that she yes, can use to protect her plants so i would always say prevention rather than cure final running around looking for a solution prevention is the best way to go about it use uh, the best way to prevent all these problems is to uh, use um, a solution of 1 teaspoon neem oil pure neem oil 1 teaspoon uh, a liquid detergent like let's say vim the stuff that we use in our kitchen so one teaspoon that one teaspoon neem oil mix it in a liter of water and spray your plant every 10 15 days you do this you make it a habit then you will find because neem works in a very different way neem will not if you already have pest neem will not get rid of it but it will work in a longer in a long long longer term right what it does it it kind of goes inside the pest uh, system and kills it from the inside so it stops the cycle 
of growth. So, you know, from eggs to larvae and all of that, you won't have any more eggs. So do that every 15 days and you will see the problem subside. But it will take a long time, mind you. So Nita is also asking, I think a lot of have, us have this problem. We have tulsi plants, but some of them are not surviving. Okay, so the thing with tulsi is that you have to know that tulsi is an annual. Okay, I didn't know this for the longest. It's not a perennial plant. So it's not like, like the, the cycle tree, which will keep growing over and over again. Now, tulsi, we grow it in pots. We, it lasts for like nine to 10 months. And in the 11th month, it's dead and we feel really sad, right? But if you leave it there, because tulsi will grow, it will flower and it will give out seeds, right? If you leave it there, don't water it right then, but water it some once spring begins. In the winter, you leave it. If you'll find that it usually dies in the winter months. In the spring, you'll notice little, little tulsi plants come up. So it's not like your plant has died. It just one cycle is over. So two more questions, sorry, because uh, we definitely want to try to answer as many as possible. Yes, yes, Care course. for croutons, please. Care for croutons? Yes. Yeah. So protons are actually outdoor plants because they need a lot of, if you look at a croton, you'll notice that, I mean, that is why crotons are beloved, right? Because they have these beautifully colored leaves and like they have mad colors. But what does that mean? The more, the brighter a plant's leaves are, the more light they require. Because to be able to produce those beautiful colors, your plant needs more sunlight to photosynthesize. So number one care point is, if, uh, if you have protons, give them direct sunlight or bright indirect sunlight like we discussed, but for a longer period, right? Feed them, give them, uh, give them fertilizers twice a month. I don't, I mean, organic fertilizers, whatever you prefer, feed them regularly, but, and, and make sure that you use your neem oil solution to keep pests at bay. Always water when the soil is completely dry and but number one is light. Protons require more light. All right. I think we've already taken up a lot of time. So any last tips you'd like to leave us with as we end the session for today? Uh, I mean, the only thing I'd say is get more plants, go out because plants are great. Even if you kill them, it doesn't matter because, you know, you should be able to observe and learn. I mean, understand why your plant died. Once you can figure that out, a lot of it, you know, a lot of gardening will become simpler. So really take the time and observe what your plants are telling you. And if you find that difficult to do, I have a whole section on what your plant is telling you in my book. So go out and get that. I mean, it's a fantastic book because it's filled with pictures. And yeah, but I would say attention is more important than anything else. So pay attention. So please to do plant. show us your book again. And how do we buy your fertilizer? Manish is asking. So this is my book. It's called How Not to Kill Your House Plant, A Beginner's Guide to Plant Parenting. And it has beautiful pictures. I think that's the croton. Yeah. So, and these pictures were all taken by Soil, in, uh, Soil there, in, one of India's best online sellers. You can buy this book on Amazon and you can buy my soil mix. It's not, a, it's not fertilizer, it's a soil mix. It looks like this. You can buy this from me right now. I'm just selling on Instagram because it's a one man show, one woman show <laughs> and I've just started it. But you can reach out to me on Instagram. I'm at a planter's daughter and I would be happy to help you out. Well, thank you so much and so excited. I think you've motivated all of us to kind of say, okay, you know what? It's not so hard. And I think those list of 10 plants is going to be very, very helpful for at least a lot of us beginners. So with that, I wish you all a very, very good weekend. And as always, we have lots of exciting programs coming up on Sipping Thoughts. So please do keep checking on our website. We've got all the programs listed there.